When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crab Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, a man who is whelmed, but not overly. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Ninja vs. Unicorn by the creative minds over at Pipeworks Brewing Company, Garage Grade, a big four and a half bottle caps out of five. This is a double IPA that celebrates the epic battle between two hop heads. Brewed with over five pounds of hops per barrel, this unfiltered beer is sure to please. Whether you're rooting for the mythical horned horse or the deadly assassin of the East, you are going to love Ninja vs. Unicorn. And today's beer was brought to us by the True Crime Garage Army. First up, a big, big shout out and thank you to our friend Kramer at Taste Tavern, Inc. in the great state of Washington. And a big shout out to Cecilia, you're breaking my heart, in Oxford, Mississippi. Next up, we have Veronica in Parts Unknown who says, Golden State Killer, talk amongst yourselves. I wonder if that shout out is from so long ago that it wasn't solved. And a big shout out to Jilly from Citrus Heights, California. Next, we have Amanda showing love from Omaha, Nebraska. Hashtag don't litter. And last but certainly not least, a big, big thank you to Roxanne. Everyone we just mentioned contributed to the beer fund at truecrimegarage.com. And for that, we thank you. And make sure you follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at True Crime Garage, and that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Stephen Paul Elliott Smith, known simply as Elliott, was born in Omaha, Nebraska on August 6, 1969. An only child, his parents were Gary Smith, a then student at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Bunny K. Berryman, an elementary school music teacher. Seemingly, Elliott followed his mother's creative footsteps, 
with a shared passion for music. He went on to become an acclaimed singer-songwriter and a skillful instrumentalist. Elliot was just six months old when his parents got divorced. Following this, his mother uprooted to Duncanville, Texas with her infant son. It was there where she met her new partner, Charlie Welsh, and began what was reportedly an agonizing chapter in Smith's young life. Elliot was said to endure a turbulent relationship with his stepfather. He claimed his childhood was tainted by cruelty and sexual abuse. These allegations have been denied by Welsh, though Charlie is referenced in Elliot's songs, including Flowers for Charlie and No Confidence Man. Despite his hardship, Elliot found a positive outlet. He started playing piano at the age of nine. Soon after, he was introduced to the acoustic guitar, a gift from his biological father. Around this time, Smith wrote Fantasy, original piano piece, winning him a prize in an arts festival. At the age of 14, Elliot went to live with his father, who was working as a psychiatrist in Portland, Oregon. Adolescence was a period where Smith found his artistic style. He started to experiment with recording and played clarinet in the high school band, adding to his repertoire of instruments. He too sang in the bands A Murderer of Crows and Stranger Than Fiction, billed as Stephen Smith or Johnny Panic, but Elliot was venturing down a darker path. Within a circle of friends, drugs and alcohol were prevalent. This behavior was considered a coping strategy, a way to help navigate the inner demons of his youth. After graduating from Lincoln High School as a National Merit Scholar, Smith dropped the name Stephen, choosing instead to be called Elliot. He attended Hampshire College in Elmhurst, Mass. in 1991. He graduated with a degree in philosophy and political science. It was in Hampshire that Elliot formed the band Heat Miser. The band made three albums before being signed to Virgin Records and releasing a final album in 1996. That same year, Elliot moved to Brooklyn, New York. As an artist, Elliot's known for his soft, almost whispered vocals and complex, yet simple melodies. Fans of his work have praised his intensely personal lyrics, though there are themes of sadness, anger, and self-destruction throughout. These are layered with a bare-bones vulnerability. The writing can be interpreted as both relatable and cryptic in nature. In 1997, Elliot would be approached by director Gus Van Zandt. Van Zandt wanted Elliot to be a part of the soundtrack for the upcoming movie, Good Will Hunting. The soundtrack featured two songs from the albums Roman Candle and Either Or, with the third song, Miss Misery. Following the film's outright success, Elliot received a nomination for Academy Award for Miss Misery. Despite being in all of the Oscars experience, he was quoted to have described the event as surreal and otherworldly. In the background, Elliot was believed to be struggling with heavy drinking and the use of antidepressants. Major label DreamWorks signed Elliot in 1998 the album EXO was released, the most profitable accomplishment of his career. Sadly, it was at this point Elliot's mental well-being began to decline. He spoke openly of suicide and reportedly made at least one serious attempt to end his own life. When highly intoxicated, Elliot planned to jump to his death. His fall was broken by a tree which left him injured but alive. In the early 2000s, Elliot's mental health became a serious concern. He was likely experienced paranoia and delusions, adamant that a vehicle was following his every move and that his label, DreamWorks, was plotting against him, breaking into his house and stealing songs from his computer. It's noted that Elliot may have gone days without eating or sleeping and plans to produce a follow-up album to XO were dissolved. Reports state that Elliot complained about the intrusion of his personal life as well as poor promotion of his previous work. He apparently begged the label 
to renounce all ties, therefore ending his contract. Or else, he threatened to take his own life. In 2001, Elliot was said to be smoking up to $1,500 of heroin and crack cocaine daily and may have tried to overdose as a result of his suicidal state. His disheveled appearance was unrecognizable during the occasional performances he managed to attend. It was known to exhibit alarming signs of awkwardness and memory loss to the point of forgetting song lyrics. In late 2002, Elliot and his girlfriend, Jennifer Sheba, were involved in an altercation with the Los Angeles Police Department outside a music concert. Allegedly, Elliot was trying to defend a man who was being harassed by the officers in question. This resulted in a brawl and Elliot being arrested. Concerned over Elliot's appearance emerged, he was described as looking out of control. After Elliot's arrest, things were looking more promising. In January and February of 2003, he achieved two sellout acoustic shows at the Henry Fonda Theater in Hollywood. Outwardly, it appeared he was aiming to regain his integrity as a performer. It's been speculated that Elliot had attempted rehab several times to no avail. I couldn't do the first step, he stated. I couldn't say what you're supposed to say and mean it. After his 34th birthday, though Elliot cut out alcohol and ended his long-term use of psychiatric medication, he also gave up caffeine, red meat, and refined sugar, hopeful of recovery after many years of unease. He began to re-emerge himself into recording, exploring different styles and recording techniques. Elliot played Red Fest at the University of Utah on September 19th, 2003. His closing song was The Beatles' Long, Long, Long. This would be Elliot's final performance. On October 21st, 2003, paramedics were called to Elliot's home in Echo Park, California. His girlfriend, Jennifer, who shared the home with Elliot, made the call. Elliot was found with two stab wounds to the chest, and he could not be revived. At 1.36 p.m., Elliot Smith was pronounced dead. In Jennifer's account, Following an argument with Elliot, she took a shower, locking the bathroom door. Hearing an unnerving scream, she opened the door to find Elliot standing with a knife in his chest. On impulse, she pulled the knife out, causing him to collapse. She promptly called 911 at 12.18 p.m. A suicide note written on a post-it was rumored to be nearby. The note read, I'm sorry. Love, Elliot. God forgive me. Was this the result of Elliot's inner pain, an act that he's been threatening for a long time? Or is there something more to this story? Suicide or homicide? There are unanswered questions and mysteries surrounding the events of October 21st, 2003. What really happened to Elliot Smith? question becomes suicide 
or homicide. And because of the inconclusive autopsy ruling, the Los Angeles Police Department's investigation remains open on this case. So even though most people say it's a suicide, why would the investigation remain open? Yeah, this is a tricky one because we have a situation here where there seems to be some kind of argument, and it seems like it was a big argument. Yeah. Um, And then later what we have is we have one man dead, and then the only person that is there to tell us what could have happened or what led to this individual's death is somebody that you might suspect could have a reason for killing this man. So it's, it's very difficult when you only have this one, let's call it eyewitness right. to, to talk to, um, you have to go off of what their statements are and based off of the scientific evidence that's out there. Now his girlfriend, Jennifer Sheba, what she claims is that they were in an argument for several hours Now, this is backed up by neighbors hearing yelling, hearing doors slam, hearing cabinets slam. Mm -hmm. So that part of the story, we could believe what Jennifer is saying because it's backed up by other witnesses. Mm -hmm. So there are many points of speculation and many things that point to suicide or homicide. So we want to dive into each one of those points. The first one being that there is no hesitation wounds. So what that means is normally when somebody commits suicide by knife, which is a very small percent of all suicides, normally, and they actually put this in the same category as a stabbing or cutting, like somebody cutting their wrist. Mm -hmm. They put this in the same category. That is still a very small percentage of all suicides. Now, Normally, when somebody stabs themselves, there's hesitation wounds. Right. Meaning there's a couple marks around the actual area where they stab. Elliot was actually stabbed twice, which is also unusual. Mm-hmm. Now, here's where it gets a little convoluted because the hesitation wounds could actually have been destroyed by him actually stabbing himself. So there could have been hesitation wounds But because he was stabbed twice, those could have got rid of the evidence of the hesitation wounds. So these two stab wounds that that led to his death, Mm -hmm. these are deep stab wounds. So what you're saying is there could have been one or two quick little stab marks that, that you cannot detect now because these two are so big. Yeah. And when I originally heard of Elliot Smith's suicide... I remember hearing that the rumor was, because I was a big Goodwill Hunting fan, and to know Elliot through that movie, basically, that's how I knew of his music. I remember the rumor was that Elliot Smith, oh, that super depressed singer-songwriter guy. Yes, he took his own life. How did he take his own life? He stabbed himself in the heart with a spoon. That was the rumor that I heard for years. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking, well, maybe it wasn't the doll end of the spoon. It would have been the handle of the spoon. But now, having the time to investigate it, you go, okay, he stabbed himself twice in the chest. Or that's what the speculation is. Um, So the other strange thing about there being no hesitation marks is the majority of the people that actually stab themselves do so not through clothing. So if they have a shirt on, they'll lift the shirt up or unbutton the shirt. And so when they go to stab themselves, it is knife through skin, and that is it. Mm -hmm. Not the case in Elliot Smith's death. He stabs himself through the shirt. And so you're going to stab yourself twice through the shirt. Another thing that points more towards homicide than suicide. Well, and some people might be thinking, well, that's a crazy thing to say. Stabbing through a shirt is very uncommon. But straight from the autopsy report, here, here is what we have from their own words, is there are several aspects of the circumstances that are atypical of suicide and raise the possibility of homicide. These include the absence of hesitation wounds, stabbing through clothing, 
and the presence of small incised wounds on the right arm and left hand, possible defensive wounds. So he was stabbed with a kitchen knife, with a regular one, uh, you know, just a blade on one side, one sharp side kitchen knife. All right, so the first point, the no hesitation wounds, I'm going to say we don't know if they were there or not. So to me, that doesn't point either way to suicide or homicide. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I agree 100%. The other thing here, too, is I could see a situation where there was there was never going to be any hesitation wounds. Right. You know, if we have if we have this guy, let's say he's just angered out of his mind. Mm -hmm. We know they're in an argument. We know they're in an argument. He picks up what's readily available, a kitchen knife from his kitchen and boom, one in and boom, another one. So according to the coroner report to the autopsy, right? Uh, the cause of death is stab wounds to the chest. Each stab wound is considered fatal per se, you know, meaning if this were to be untreated for any length of time, this guy's going to die. Right. And they say that, um, the second wound appears to have been deeper than the first because they're saying that there is a perforating wound to the heart associated with stab wound number two. Wow. And the situation that gets difficult here is like you said, the, they cannot find any hesitation wounds on this individual. So I'm with you. It, it could go either way. When you, when there is a, an offender stabbing a victim, you typically will not see any hesitation wounds because they are attacking the individual. Right. So on the second point, him stabbing himself through a shirt, to me that doesn't seem super likely, not impossible obviously, but you know, the coroner is even saying, Hey, this is, this is something that we look at. This leads more to the side of homicide. So I go, okay, no, no hesitation marks. I don't know what that means. So we can lean on the side of suicide there. But with the stabbing through the shirt, I go, to me, that leans homicide. Yeah, and that's exactly what they are saying in their report, in the medical report, that this is one of the reasons to point toward homicide rather than suicide. So I'll agree with that as well. Uh, the difficult thing here is the shirt is described as a black T-shirt. Again, I could see a situation. This guy's so angered out of his mind that there's there's no cooling down going on for this guy. Yeah, that, I agree. That it could be pick up pick up the readily available knife through the t-shirt. You know, taking off the shirt may have provided a, a cooling down period to go, wait a second, what am I doing? What am I what what's going on here? Right. And that's I think so we both agree that we'll lean towards homicide on that point. Yeah. I'll, but, but, but it's not impossible, not impossible, but I'm going to agree with the expert opinion here. Yeah. The other one too, is that there's actually, um, bone breakage or, or damage to the bone with the stabbings. And there's two, again, this is difficult because it's not a situation where he's home by himself and, and he's just depressed and decided that's it. Mm -hmm. He's in an argument, but most of the time when they see a suicide by stabbing or cutting or cutting, there is, they're not hitting bone. Well, a lot of that time I'm, I'm guessing from the cutting situation would be cutting at the wrist yeah, and, and yeah. you're not going to hit bone there. Likely. I think here Which would make the percentage way lower, much, much lower. And I think that the situation here is very difficult to really get a grasp on what the percentage would be here because of the location of the stab wounds. So the location of the stab wounds, it would be very difficult not to hit or break bone right in that location. So, but I do want to point out one thing while we're, you know, talking about these stab wounds is they do point out in the autopsy report that the stab wounds are consistent with self-infliction. Okay. So what they mean by that is the angle of these stab wounds, it would not have been impossible for him to have done this himself. Right. So it, it's not, we're not talking about a Fami Malik type autopsy report where there's a, a gunshot wound to somebody 
you know, in their back or the back of the head and in a weird location. This is a location. These two stab wounds are right to the chest, to the chest cavity. And he could have done this, you know, from this angle, he could have done this himself, or it could be also consistent with somebody lunging at him with a knife. Well, and then you have the angle of the blade Mm -hmm. and the rumor that I heard is that the angle that the blade was at is more consistent with homicide than suicide. But with it being such a small blade, I wonder if that even matters or if that should be something that we even take into play. That is too difficult for me to get a grasp on from looking at the autopsy report. I cannot figure out if these are vertical or horizontal right. wounds. Um, the, there is a diagram on there. Now people can find portions. I couldn't find the entire autopsy report, but you can find portions of this. And it looks to me judging by reports that I've read in the past and what I can see on the, the papers I have here. My guess is that this autopsy report is probably anywhere from 14 to 21 pages long. Wow. But I could find five pages of, of the actual autopsy report. So the one page that I have that has the diagram of, of his body and where they're marking out the wounds, it's the two wounds that they have here. It looks like they're indicating that these would be vertical stab wounds, but I can't say 100% because of the way that this is drawn out. And the, the notes that were taken on this diagram are all written in shorthand. Yeah. And so it's, it's difficult for me to say what, what the medical examiner was, um, was trying to convey here in this diagram because, you know, for her, Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, very likely, especially if she, she determines that it's suicide, it's a document that is only necessary for her. So it's not like it has to be typed out. Um, they would type these out typically in more detail, right? but that page is missing from what I could find. So I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that they haven't closed the investigation or it might just be the website where it got this from is not it. Okay. So it's not like a typical website where you would go hunting for autopsy reports. They, this just might be the portion that they decided to release on their website. If that makes sense. Right. Right. So they're, they're taking a bit of creative control here and decided, look, a lot of this is, is medical mumbo jumbo, uh, and it won't be of interest to our readers. Right. So we will we will present the the pages that are of most interest or what we think that they will find most interest interest in. But like you were saying, if if in fact these are vertical wounds, I, I mean, trying to make the motion myself with my right hand or left hand, mm-hmm. that does make it a little more difficult. I could, I could see if they were horizontal wounds, it being easier to stab myself in the chest and, and give more force and thrust. Right. And I think unless you're you're coming across the chest, like as if you're like beating your chest, mm -hmm. I, I could see that being more vertical. And, but to your point is that if these are in fact vertical wounds, that would be more consistent with a homicide with somebody, you know, lunging forward and attacking him. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. 
Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. The Angie's List you know and trust is now Angie. And we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews. But now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today. All right, back to the open investigation of Elliot Smith, suicide or homicide. The other thing that is strange here is, like you said, there's defensive wounds. And right when you hear the term defensive wounds, you go, aha, yeah, aha, got him. But these defensive wounds, it's not that simple. There's not a lot of defensive wounds on the hands where you would think somebody that was trying to defend themselves would be marked up more. Again, though, it's also hard to figure out because it's not like we have the knife in front of us. And if it's just like a more of a dull kitchen knife, you might not see as many defensive wounds as you would with like a sharp butcher knife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're not saying for certain that these are in fact defensive wounds because if they were 100% on that, they're going to go, okay, this is not only an undetermined death, right? This is a homicide. This is a homicide. And we, we need to look at this or further investigate it into, to the point to where we can say it's not a homicide. So the thing with these two wounds, um, and it may be more than two, but it says the presence of a small incised wounds, on the right arm and left hand. Mm -hmm. And then they say possible defensive wounds. So I could see, you know, obviously with the hand, you, the, in a lot of times when there are attacks, you see several cuts to the hands where the person is able to fend off the attacker for a decent amount of time until the, until they end up, they end up being attacked to the point of their death. But I don't, I don't think I fully understand the the wound to the right arm. Yeah, it's it's more like towards the chest area, right, or towards the shoulder area. It, Am I right about that? Or you could be from from this report, though. Again, this is in shorthand, so I don't know what this this mark is indicating here on the right arm. It looks like it could be more than halfway up the arm. Right, and this is where it gets strange for me too, because. We have reports of them slamming doors and slamming cabinets, and we all know one of our friends that have gotten in an argument and punched something, you know, whether it was a refrigerator or a door. or mm-hmm. And so I wondered, is it possible that Elliot was upset and tried to punch something, or and 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 maybe there's no evidence of him? I I once punched a skillet. It was the dumbest thought. But at the time, you're you're just in an argument. You're upset. Punch <laughs> you you normally punch something that you shouldn't punch, and so I just wondered if any of these wounds to the hand would be something that would happen from from that. The way that it's described sounds almost like a some form of cut, though, right. which would go to the thought of defensive wound because of the the knife being the what ended up killing Elliot Smith. I think the the difficult thing here is I we don't have Jennifer. I don't know anything about his girlfriend. Right. 
I don't know where they line up size wise compared to one another. If well, he was bigger than her, but that, but not you know. Right, and what what I'm getting at here is that I think that we. I feel like I would see a situation if this was a homicide that there would be many more defensive wounds. I agree to Elliot Smith because I think he would have been able to fight her off or fend her off for a good amount of time. And keep in mind, we know let's let's pretend he was attacked. Okay, let's pretend for a moment this was a homicide. We know that he would have been attacked straight on face to face right because that's where the wounds came from yeah it's it's not like we have a situation where we can think that he would have been attacked by, from behind and it was a bit of a sneak attack or anything like that this would be a situation where he would be able to defend himself for a decent amount of time and i think for me the small amount of speculative defensive wounds points to maybe those are either self-inflicted or caused from something else. Well, and she claims that, you know, they're arguing for hours and hours, and finally she's like, this is nuts, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going, I'm going to take a shower, and I'm going to get away. And then once she goes in, he's now telling her to come out, you know, basically, hey, if you don't come out, you know, I'm going to kill myself. He's threatening to kill himself, according to her. Right. And, again, we don't know her, but we know his life. And somebody that has talked about suicide as openly as he did for one, but two, we've seen it time and time again where he would threaten this. Hey, you don't want me, you don't want to let me out of my record contract. Mm -hmm. I'll kill myself. Mm -hmm. That's on record. So at least we can say, Hey, there is some evidence that backs up what Jennifer is saying. I go to the bathroom. Uh, we're in this argument and then it becomes, you know, come out or I'm going to kill myself. Now, she says she's only in there like five to ten minutes. For this five to ten minutes, mm -hmm. is Elliot walking around with the knife? It, it, you know, does he, you know, accidentally cut himself in the hand or does he does he purposely do it? Um, who knows? We, we, we won't. We just don't know. But I believe that part of her story because we have evidence to back that up. So it would be interesting to know which side the blade was on the sharp side of the knife per his wounds. And I say that because with, with where this wound is on the, uh, arm. Right. I, I could see that, that maybe because if he did stab himself, he stabbed himself twice in the chest at least. Right. And so we know the knife was removed from the body and then entered the body again. I almost wonder if the, the wound to the hand or to the arm, if it's a possibility, depending on what side the blade was on, could that have been from the knife being removed? And the other thing we should keep in mind, too, is she, Jennifer, when she finds Elliot, he's still awake and, according to her report, is standing at the time that she finds him. She removes the knife from his chest yeah so let's unpack this this part of the story a little bit more well she, she, real, real quick here mm -hmm. but just before 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 i forget this thought completely my where i'm going with this too is could this have been could he have put his hand to his chest grasping at the pain and she removes the knife and then that that knife upon that removal could cause the wound to the hand there's ways that these could be right. These wounds could have occurred without them being an intentional by him or her. Well, yeah, and part of that story is that she pulls the knife from him. He collapses. Look at the 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 one chest wound or the shoulder wound, whatever we're calling it. Is it possible when she pulls the knife out that he falls into the knife? So because he does collapse, so that that's a possibility to explain away some of those. What's very difficult is Jennifer was trained extensively in first aid. And so she would have known that you do not pull the knife out. You just add pressure. You call 911, you add pressure, you do not take the knife out because sometimes pulling the knife out causes more damage than it does going in. There are some people that she has worked with that have came forward and said, hey, 
I went to the classes with her. She knew. She knew better. But then on the flip side, the argument becomes, yes, that's when you're in a controlled environment. There's no panic. There's no blood. You know, she comes out of the bathroom because she hears this agonizing scream. He turns around. There's a knife in him. She pulls it out. Now, people that are going to say, hey, this is homicide. Well, what a great way to cover it up. Oh, he stabbed himself or I stabbed him. I'll just tell everybody I pulled the knife out. Mm -hmm. That explains why my fingerprints are on this knife. Yeah. That explains why my hands are bloody when you, when the authorities show up. Right. And so it's kind of weird to me that people that she worked with would come forward and say, Hey, we took these classes together. She knows better. So to me, that part, it's again, it's tough. It's that gray area because there's a part of me that goes, yes, she knew what to do in class, but you've been in a heated argument with somebody that you love or somebody that you live with, somebody you're connected with, somebody that has had a lot of issues, and and so then you freak out and you pull out a knife. You do something you're not supposed to do. But she did call 911. Yeah, so the the words of the medical examiner are this. Additionally, the girlfriend's reported removal of the knife and subsequent refusal to speak with detectives are all of concern. So th- this is not our opinion that the removal of the knife is a concern. It's right. the opinion of Los Angeles County. Right. Now I did I did find something. Sorry, because I'm I'm reading as we are doing this because I was looking for more information on these other what we were talking about just before the possible defensive wounds. Well, and we also wanted to cover this a little different. We want to have it be more of like a off the record, just kind of a open discussion. Captain wanted me going into this blind, let's say. Yeah. Uh, with very little information or knowledge about the case. So according to the body examination from Los Angeles County, a small slight laceration is noted to the palm of the left and right hand. And another slight laceration is noted under the upper right arm as well. Mm -hmm. So under the upper right arm, uh, that's a little, that's away from the heart. Yeah. So that that's likely not caused by what I thought of possibly removing the knife after the first stab and then stabbing myself again. But the, the thing that's tricky here is, but if she removed the knife and he collapsed forward, the knife could have hit him mm-hmm. under the right arm. The small slight laceration is noted to the palm which of is, the left and right hand, which is possible if he's using both hands to stab himself, mm-hmm. it could have slipped on the second stabbing. Yeah. So that that's a possibility. But again, it's strange. But also you know. consistent with me putting my hands up trying to stop an attack. But mm-hmm. I would expect there where they say small, slight laceration, if I've put my hands up and in a way to, to, to stop someone from attacking me uh-huh. and I'm hitting the palm with, with that knife, I'm expecting to see... There's going to be force. There's going to be power behind that blade. And I would expect there to be these to be deep wounds to the palms. I mean, you could almost envision a scenario where he's picking up a knife and test it real quick on one hand. Right. Because, I mean, if, if he's determined to do this, he's going to grab a sharp knife. And like you said, the, the, the other hand could have simply been from slippage from now we have, we have blood entered into the equation. We got a slippery situation. His hand could have slipped for the second stab wound. And mind you, we do know that based off of the, the, how deep these two wounds are, that very likely the second stab wound was with more power, with more force. Which is strange to me because to me that leans more homicide than suicide because you would think after the first stab he would be weakened he'd be weakened but again adrenaline i mean you know hmm. yeah you, you you it's 
you know, it's such a, what's also sad about this is here's a guy that went through all this stuff and obviously had some trauma from his younger days and wrestling with a lot of stuff, but seemed like he was turn, turning a corner. And even afterwards, his girlfriend said it didn't make any sense because he was so healthy. That This was probably the healthiest he had been since the time she had known him. Right. So, but that doesn't mean that he didn't relapse because, you know, I think with depression or at least everybody deals with depression differently, but I've always with friends or family members that don't really understand depression or, 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 or you know, I, you know, I've had people tell me I, I've been depressed a couple of times, but I don't understand a, a daily depression or, a, or you just live with depression throughout your life. Well, to me, it's very similar to like alcoholism or something where it's like you wake up and you need to do certain things every day to kind of keep yourself uh, above that low level and and so is it possible that he was eating better and exercising and and staying away from drugs and and all that kind of stuff and then he just but he still had a relapse of things aren't going so well today and we just happen to get in an argument and that just pushes him over the edge well so we have a couple things here and this is from jennifer's statements we said that you know according to the report that her refusal to speak with detectives is of concern, which should be. But in her statement, what she stated to either law enforcement or to the medical examiner, I believe this would be to law enforcement, is that Jennifer stated that the decedent has suffered from depression all of his life. He had a history of multiple narcotics addiction, heroin, crack, and alcohol abuse, although he had been clean for over one year. He engaged in self-mutilating behavior and would burn himself with cigarettes. He has a history of one possible suicide attempt, but they go on to say that it's unknown details or time frame or circumstances and has a consistent history of verbal suicide threats. Right. Uh, The decedent sought treatment for his depression from several psychiatrists and was being treated with multiple prescription drugs. And according to the toxicology report, the only substances they found in his system at the time of his death were all prescribed medications right. to no... him. These are therapeutic medications or, 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 or that's what they're right, prescribed right. There's, for. There's no traces of illegal substances or alcohol. Mm-hmm. Because what's not clear is we go, hey, these these medications were prescribed. What I would like to know is when. When were they prescribed? And not just saying, like, I'm talking about when was the initial, hey, we're going to put you on X drug to help you with depression. Was that six weeks ago? Was that he's been on it for a year? Because sometimes they have reverse effects. And I've had friends that have had a mild case of depression, never having suicidal thoughts and then getting on antidepressants instead of it working. Now they have suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so again, I wonder, is this, were they trying something out? Cause sometimes it takes weeks and weeks for these to take effect in a good way or a negative way. So that could be a, a possible, um, reason why this person that was now clean and getting their stuff together and the healthiest quote unquote he's been since Jennifer knew him that he would be in the state that he would want to stab himself not once but twice well and medications are such a difficult thing and and I I do not I do not care for doctors that just kind of willy-nilly prescribe things to people I know that that it seems like the medical profession that people are getting better about that. Doctors are getting more strict about that and policing Uh themselves as well as their patients. Right. But that's what happens when lawsuits happen. Yeah. But I, I can recall two situations for me. Once I was prescribed Ritalin and I was on it for 
several months, it made me incredibly like, I can't even explain how depressed I was. Right. And that's the only, I don't know 100% that it came from the Ritalin, but that was the only thing that was different in my life at that time. Right. And so I, you know, finally got smart and quit taking it. And then another situation I had where I was going through some, um, anxiety stuff and asked my doctor for, to prescribe something. And I cannot recall the name of what I was prescribed, but I took it on a Sunday and this was like a narcotic though. This was one of those deals where you get the prescription and it has to have like the stamp, like the it's written on special paper. And, uh, so I got this thing and I called my doctor on Monday, uh, the day after I took one and I said, we gotta, we gotta get some other kind of prescription here. And she said, what's the problem? I said, I took one of these and I felt like I shotgun eight beers. Like I was, I was effed yeah, up. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I was, I was, he was, F. I was, F. I was effed in the F. <laughs> right. So the, the medication is a difficult thing, but according to the autopsy report and according to statements from his girlfriend, Jennifer, he was clean for over a year. Now, she stated in this report, too, that she knew him for four years yeah, and that they were only together for one year and they were living together at the time. I wonder, is this a situation where maybe they liked each other and she's like, look, dude, you're, you're on some hardcore drugs. Right. Clean your shit up and we might be able to have a relationship. Yeah, I mean... Or this is, you know, somebody she admired and went, you know, he's really talented, but that doesn't mean you want to be in a relationship with a talent, talented drug addict because that's what he was. Yeah. And as you said, Jennifer pulled the knife out of the decedent's chest and saw two cuts on his chest. I find that a strange statement, yeah. a little bit strange that she, he's wearing a black t-shirt. We can assume there's quite a bit of blood involved. I don't know how the shirt would have been tore from those from those two uh, stab wounds. Right. But I think to visibly and to immediately notice two wounds seems a little strange to me. Well, right, but let's, okay. Let's but she did. Let's this a little bit because go ahead. She, he did collapse, right? Yes. So it's one of those things where it's like she goes, well, I pulled the knife out, then I saw these two stab wounds. He walks away from her after she pulls out the knife and then collapses. Collapses, but but then at some point she calls nine one one and yes. she she then goes over and tries to help him. Right? She or, she or called nine one one immediately, according to her statement, and performed citizen CPR and first aid with operator assistance until paramedics arrived. Right, and so on the nine one one call, we'd have at least uh, evidence of that, or evidence of her faking that. Yeah, because we have seen situations where people are like, no, he couldn't have killed his wife. He clearly performed CPR on her. You can hear it on the 911 call. And then scientifically, they determine later that the the husband faked, you know, just pretended to be doing the chest compressions or or any form of CPR. But again, when she goes over, calls 911, and maybe she saw the two stab wounds then. Just making the statement that you saw two stab wounds they're claiming that she's saying it right away. I, I pull the knife. I see the two stab wounds. According to their statement. According yes. to their statement. What I'm saying is, though, as you know, before the paramedics get there, if she noticed that there was two stab wounds, I want to think that was too odd. Right, because we do know that she, if if she's to be believed, she was performing CPR on him at some point. Would have noticed if she didn't notice them immediately. She would have definitely noticed the two stab wounds then, I would guess. Yeah. And and so then the paramedics come, and then they take him to the hospital, and he's... Yeah, he, he he's alive at this time. He's not awake. Yeah. He can't speak to anybody, but he technically passes away at the hospital. Again, I think this points more towards suicide because somebody that has this knowledge, quote-unquote, this knowledge of first aid, if somebody was going to commit homicide and try to cover it up, why don't you wait a little bit longer? To call 911? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, the you know, because, again, when you hear stories, I mean, the first story that I heard was he stabbed himself with a spoon. I remember thinking, 
at the time because I was pretty young and and being an artist or, or trying to be an artist, thinking, what an artsy way to go. The guy stabbed himself with a spoon. And then you come to find out it was not well, a Well, that's like the telephone game. You know what I mean? It right, gets, right. Or, or some guy who goes fishing, the fish gets bigger every time he tells the story. Yeah. Well, that's also that's also like fandom, though, right? Like, yeah, fans are going, and and rightfully so. This was a very talented individual, and uh, you can see a situation where where fans are going. He was not a regular man. He can't have regular means of death. Right, right. Even though he threatened suicide multiple times, he would never have taken his own life. I think, and if he did, it would have been with a spoon or some yeah, it something have been dramatic. With a spoon. Yeah. Although this certainly in itself, let's say, let's let's pretend it is one hundred percent suicide. Yeah, Th- this is very dramatic, a very dramatic fashion. So, but I, but again, I think some of that is maybe not so much dramatic as it is adrenaline and or, impulsive. Yeah, and very impulsive. Yeah, and I and I think somebody that struggled, obviously he's impulsive. I mean, he was a crackhead at one point. So I think that is evidence of impulsivity. And so you you have a situation where he can't control this. He's had a hard time controlling himself. Okay, now I can control it by taking my life. Or, or, you know, and and look, for all we know, he was going, I'm going to do it. I'm going to stab myself. And she could have said, go ahead. Go ahead and stab yourself. And a lot of people would go, well, then she's responsible on some level. Mm-hmm. I would argue that this is probably not the first argument they had. And I'd also probably argue this is probably not the first time that they were in an argument that he probably threatened to kill himself. He seems like somebody, I mean, if you're threatening to kill yourself to your record label, how many other people have you tried to use that? Right. And one thing I do want to clear up too, make sure that we're clear on this is in her statement where she says, so in, in the County of Los Angeles, in their investigators narrative, what they're saying here is he has a history of one possible suicide attempt, but they go on to say unknown details, unknown time frame, unknown circumstances. That's because this is just simply her Jennifer saying, yeah, I, I think he attempted suicide on one other occasion, but she's unable to provide any details of such. So they're, they're being very clear with their statement of that is that they're not definitively saying that he has a history of suicide attempts. Right. Again, and it could be some fandom, but there, the rumor for the longest time was that he tried to kill himself and a a tree broke the fall, which left him injured, but he wasn't dead. And then there was also reports that he actually OD'd multiple times on drugs. And then that becomes, did he just OD because he was using heroin and or using tried to OD. Or, or was it on purpose? So when you have somebody that OD'd multiple times and you go, okay, well, w- which one is it? And then you could also make an argument that how much do you value your, your life if you're constantly using these drugs that can possibly kill you mm-hmm. every time that you use them. This this is a difficult one for me because I I've, I just always heard these rumors and, and this was one that was actually brought up by listeners several times and it would be random. It'd just be, and it wasn't multiple. It was never multiple times. It was never like I got an email that said, check out Elliot Smith's suicide and and let me know what you think. Mm-hmm. I think there was something more there. Well, again, first looking at it, you start going suicide, homicide. Well, I think LAPD has it right right now. Just open because they don't know for sure. Yeah. And I think they're leaving that open in hopes that if it was homicide, that maybe um, Jennifer will say something. Maybe she'll slip up and tell somebody something, and then that is will, will lead them down to the charging her with something. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's going to happen. 
Um, and I don't know if this case will ever get closed just because there's so many things that point to homicide other, you know, rather than suicide. But I think the suicide note for me, and I think that's the, the last point, but to me, the biggest point, there is a suicide note. Yes. It's only on a posted note. Right. Now the rumors for a long time was that, you know, it says, uh, let me read it again. It doesn't have much to it, but uh, a possible suicide note written on a posted note. It read, I am sorry. Love, Elliot. God forgive me. Now, the name Elliot, there was rumors that it was spelled wrong because Elliot, he spells it with two T's. And in the coroner's report, it was spelled with one T. Well, that's all it was. It was misspelled on the coroner's report. By somebody other than Elliot Smith. Right. So it it wasn't misspelled on the post-it note. It was spelled correctly on the post-it note. But in the coroner's report, it was it was spelled incorrectly. So that was a rumor. Again, yeah. something that I heard for years that, oh, yeah, well, there was this suicide note. And it's kind of weird that it's on a post-it note. And they spelled Elliot wrong. Well, and here's here's their exact statement. A copy of a suicide note was provided by LAPD Detective King. Original will be provided on 102303. So at the time that this document's created, they've not received the original. And they just have a copy. Right. And what they're saying is the note was handwritten on a post-it and stated, quote, I'm so sorry, love Elliot with one T. God forgive me. The note is not dated. Right. So here's here's where it gets weird. So though. Detective King could have wrote this out and handed it to him and said, "This I'll get you the I'll get you the original." Again, for years I heard that there was a suicide note, but the name was spelled wrong. Now, now we know that that was just it was just a mis- pilot mistake. error. Yeah. So here's where it gets weird because you go, okay, they believe, or at least all the speculation that I've seen is that this note was written by Elliot Smith. I am sorry, love Elliot, God forgive me. I would like for them to examine just the God forgive me because I am, I'm so sorry, love Elliot. How many fights were they in that week that led to a bigger fight? And is it possible that he just wrote that out and he went for a walk one day? Yeah, just left it, yeah. And didn't write God forgive me, but... Again, everything that I've seen says this note was written by Elliot. Now, if this note was written by Elliot, Jennifer would have walked into the perfect situation. We're in this argument. He's uh, he's out of control. I can't stand I can't stand him anymore. I want him dead. I'm going to stab him. And oh look, he left this little possible suicide note. So now I can stab him twice, pull it out. I'll wait a little bit, but not too long, and I'll call 911. Again, I, I I think it's more likely this guy that threatened suicide multiple times was in a state of panic and state of acting erratic. Couldn't control the situation. Probably was making threats. The person on the other end of the threats probably thought they were hollow threats because they were hollow threats before. He writes this note. It's simple, but he wrote it. And then he stabbed himself twice and she comes out and yes, she should not have pulled the knife from his chest. But again, she called 911 when she could have waited just another five minutes or another 10 minutes or another you know what I mean? Well, and another another note regarding the note. Um, it states here that once the decedent was taken to the hospital, police officers arrived and questioned Jennifer about this incident. During this questioning, she was seated at the kitchen table and noted for the first time a post-it note that appeared to be a suicide note left by the decedent. Mm-hmm. Jennifer recognized the handwriting on the note as that of the decedent and 
had not seen the note before that moment. The knife, the knife the decedent used to stab himself was a regular kitchen knife that immediately prior to this incident had been sitting out on a cutting board in the kitchen. Right. So the, the note, according to detective King and according to these police officers, it's not believed that she saw that note beforehand. Right. So they're questioning her. They're talking to her. They're trying to figure out what's going on while he's being taken to the hospital. Right. And she then notices the note, but Mm -hmm. they're there. And look, these guys are trained to read people and they're reading somebody see this note for the first time. Well, and the thing here too, captain is that the way that this autopsy document reads, it sounds like the detectives, the exact words are detectives believe this death is possibly suspicious. It sounds to me like they were suspicious of this whole incident as soon as they arrived on the scene. Right now, the problem then becomes the person that that's dead. You can't speak to them. They can't give you their account of what happened. Right. Now we have this other person. We only have two people in this uh, apartment at the time that this incident occurs. Yeah. So if they are immediately suspicious, they have to figure out, is this person who's giving this statement, Jennifer, is she truthful? Well, we can't determine some of her truthfulness right here during this questioning because we need scientific fact. We need evidence and stuff like that to tell us if she is being truthful about the exact incident. But what we can figure out is as a whole, do we generally walk away from this conversation and believe her statement as a whole to be truthful? So what they're going to look for are things like, okay, so according to this document, it does not say in here that that she took a shower, but for instance, that's something they would use because according to the statement is she took a shower and then heard the scream. This leads me to believe that she had to end her shower abruptly and go out to find him. Well, first off, when I'm talking to this individual, does she look like she recently took a shower? Is her hair still wet? Right. Does she look like she was in a shower that was interrupted? Okay, we have spoke to the neighbors. Yes, they heard shouting. They heard some kind of argument. So what they're going to do is if they are suspicious of this person, they are going to look for reasons to feed their suspicion or look for reasons to believe her story mm-hmm. or her story is being truthful about points of the story. So again, if she were to have attacked him, we know this would have been a face to face attack. This would have been a head on attack. We see very few possible defensive wounds. And then on top of that, they're going to be looking at her and saying, does she look like she had just been in a fight? Does, is there any marks or scratches or anything on her that would lead me to believe that she's recently been in some type of altercation or some type of fight where she attacked this man. Right. And I think if they would have seen those, if that would have been obvious to them or if any points of the shower or the neighbors didn't you know, confirm the argument, they would have backed all that stuff up and they would have piled it up against her to leave, to, to have the suspicion meter tilt more toward homicide. Right. So that it could be further investigated as such. So I think here, what I'm going to go off of is similar to you. I, my determination from the outside looking in would be yes, there is cause to question this right as a suicide. But for me, there are more things that point towards suicide as well as the nine one one call. If in fact it was placed immediately, that really points to me like she was just doing her best to try to save him. And then on top of that, I'm going to factor in the, the responding officers. They don't seem to know anything in this report that they believe that she was in some type of fight before this, this occurred. So I think that, I think that there's a lack of evidence to point towards homicide here.
would like to hear your opinion, suicide or homicide, go to truecrimegarage.com and go to the blog and let us know your thoughts there. Also, if you're looking for old episodes, download the Stitcher app. They're all available for free on the Stitcher app. And our weekly show, Off the Record on Stitcher Premium, is available. Just, just go to our website and click on the Off the Record link. And if anybody wants to learn more about Elliot Smith, this great artist, you can find a lot of his music and videos on the internet. I would recommend Son of Sam is a good one, as well as his performance in the late 90s on Saturday Night Live. If anybody's looking to check out more of Elliot Smith's good, good stuff that he did give to us while he was here, I recommend doing that. All right, until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.